one of the motivations for having this webinar is just the incredible number of questions we get by email or when we're when we speak at conferences as the lift team goes around so many people are asking us questions about what is the next economy what is and if they don't call it the next economy they kind of say how can business or commerce or exchange or the things that we know as uh, popularly as economy actually help create a world that works and by works they typically say something like where people get their needs met they're fed where you know people have housing or um have even health and, and happiness and, and family and community the things that people want to thrive equitably not just some people or just rich white people but like everybody can have those things and can we do it in a way that doesn't actually destroy you know the environment moreover can we actually meet our needs and have an economy that actually heals and actually restore some of the damage that's been done over the last generations and we hear this question so often that you know we want to take moments like this to kind of share some of what we're learning and seeing in the next economy and share what the potential roles we all have to play in creating and supporting that economy that can actually is growing right now it's actually happening and so what i what I, one thing to maybe i think we all share is some of some observations about the current economy but just to ground them and to to make sure that we're in alignment as to what's happening out there is when we look at the world today we see just you know a litany of crises there's about 850 million people today who will be malnourished and hungry in a world of seven and a half billion people 900 million people will have an inadequate water supply or inadequate access to proper sanitation and the enormity of health risks th that result from those conditions uh, we also see a world where we're facing the existential threat of our time and climate change and uh, you know 50 percent of the world's species are at risk to be gone and extinct within the next 35 years the you know, so we have you know a self-evident set of environmental and social tragedies that are all around us and there's many complex reasons, obviously, as to why that condition exists, but you don't have to be far seeking in your observation and assessment to identify at some level the way in which we design and structure and move through the world of the economy, the way business works, ha tends to exploit people and planet um, at every turn. And so the existing economy, we would argue at Lyft, at Lyft economy, the existing economy the business as usual economy actually has to actually has to die um now you know does it die by bloody revolution and is it killed or or is it kind of hospiced out moreover is there an opportunity to transform that economy that's you know self-evidently broken and actually create an economy anew that actually creates those outcomes that are good for people and planet. And when we look at that economy, that one that is emerging, we call that the next economy. And let me just give some examples to you know, share like what we mean by the next economy. What does it actually look like in practice? Well, let me start again with something in the business as usual economy. We all know that we're losing somewhere between 30 and 40 billion billion tons gigatons of topsoil in the food system every year through terrible practices and mismanagement most of it is dominated by large corporations most of the loss of topsoil um, whereas agriculture employs more people in the world than any other industry uh, the and whereas it's true that smallholders still produce over 50 percent of the world's food the food that's created through industrial agriculture is done at incredible harm to species, to the topsoil, to the environment. And there's people who are saying, no, let's not do that. Let's look at organic uh, as a you know, method to change the way agriculture is done. And you know, just to subtly indict it for a moment or just show that it's important, but a little bit passe, 
there's a you know a 20,000 acre organic carrot farm in California in the Cayuma Valley that is monoculture carrots in the high desert with flood furrow water irrigation kind of uh, a complete exploitation of the local environment and water resources harvested by essentially slave labor and seasonal exploited labor in terrible conditions um, and so organic itself is a little bit less bad than some of the other exploitation we see of land and people in the food system but it's not kind of the shining golden star of what we're aiming for when we're talking about this economy that actually serves for the benefit of all life. But let me take you into Sherwood, Oregon, uh, outside of Portland, where uh, Lyft Economy recently has, um, through our partnership with Community Ventures, we started a fund called the Force for Good Fund. And I'm delighted to share that we recently became investors in a project called Our Table. Our Table, some of you on the call, on the webinar here may know of them, is a, is a multi-stakeholder cooperative farm entity, entity, meaning it's a farm, you know, it's a 60 some acre farm, you know, biodynamically grown vegetables and fruits um, and some small animal yields. And it's, uh, it's owned by the workers themselves, very rare. There's less, as far as we know, there's less than 10 farms in the United States that are actually owned by the workers. But it's not just owned by the workers themselves, it's actually owned by the community of customers that have CSA, community supported agriculture boxes that come from the Our Table Farm and also visit the farm itself where there's a storefront, which I'll mention again in a moment. But it's not just owned by the workers and the community of customers, it's also owned by a syndicate of local producers in the local to the Our Table Farm in the Willamette area. And so it ha it's a multi-stakeholder ownership model with a multi-stakeholder governance. And quite literally, that group of people gathers around a large table to break bread together and make critical decisions like how much should the workers be paid? What's a fair price for this high quality food that is nourishing our families and the community? And decisions are made collectively and collaboratively because this farm has chosen to make a ownership and governance model that is more inclusive and equitable. And it's not just the, the, the ownership and the governance. The farm is taking strategies to vertically integrate. So there's a micro marketplace storefront on site at the farm. There's a small commercial kitchen that processes the food waste. The way in which the farm is working with the soil, capturing food waste, upcycling it into high value added products, um, salsas and jams and preserves, and then has this mar marketplace that are actually like building community capacity and relationships. The farm itself is becoming more a resilient kind of anchor institution within the community. Now imagine a world where there's not just one our table. Imagine a world for a moment where our table is a blueprint or a model that could be regionally replicated and adapted. We agree at Lyft Economy, there's a lot of things, especially in that business as usual economy that don't need to grow. In fact, we would argue they probably need to die and disappear. Um, but there's a lot of things that we do want to see grow. And regionally replicable models of uh, enterprise that actually serve the community to create a more diverse, inclusive economy that actually restores and heals our environments within which we live and that surround us is something that we do want to see grow. And so each of us on this call for example, have at least three roles that we could play in summary in the next economy. One is even as a consumer, when we're still not a primary producer for our needs, if you are consuming goods um, or purchasing you know, um, uh, durable goods, um, every purchase that we make as a consumer uh, is a, plays a role in either shaping and creating and supporting the emergence of the next economy or perpetuating the business usual economy. So all of us have that role. So just getting literate about what's out there and what's possible is some of the great work of our time, increasing our own eco-literacy. A second role that we could play in this next economy is actually as a, a investor. And that may sound counterintuitive for some of us who might, you know, be looking at the scarcity of resources or personal debt or student debt and these types of things. But what we've become aware of is 
that there are actual systemic and structural problems with the way capital moves through the business as usual economy that reinforce these cycles of exploitation of land and people. And what we're excited about is there are new and emergent models to actually access the collective community capital, sometimes called the retail capital, um, and change the nature of investing where community can actually invest in and become owners of the very institutions that provide for community's needs. Small amounts, ag uh, many people aggregated into large amounts of investment that actually, actually can move the economy and move the world. And becoming literate about your role as an investor and the possibilities there are really critical in, in this time. A third role that some of us might want to play is looking at our own livelihood choices and career. So many of, say, in, for the hat I wear in the Permaculture Institute, so many of the participants who take our permaculture trainings finish the training and say, I, I get it. I love this stuff. I just hate my job. What can I do? How can I, how can I do something with my energies, my life energies, to actually be of benefit and, and still pay the rent? Uh, or, or, you know, um, send my kids uh, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, a camp in the summer, these kind of things. Uh, how, can I, how can I afford these things? And so knowing what next economy enterprises and companies are, what are the, what is a B Corp? What is a multi-stakeholder co-op? Where are they? How could I become a worker owner? How could I become an employee? Where can I find the types of jobs that actually feed my soul? Um, and uh, are in alignment with my values and actually generate an income with that strategy for my needs today. That's another role that we can play. And then a fourth role that I know Lift Economy definitely has a burgeoning network and we have done some online trainings before is those people who say, I want to be an entrepreneur. Um, I, I, I want to start the hour table in my community or I want to start the community supported kitchen in my community, or I want to start the worker owned waste management company, or there's a missing, there's a gap in my region and somebody needs to start it. And myself and a couple of my friends and allies, we're going to be the ones who are going to start it. How do I do that? What are the skills that I need to actually make choices, to access resources, to hire people, to focus on personal growth and development? How do we do marketing and sales and make all the relationships that are necessary to grow an enterprise with the right structure and the right governance so that we actually are a healing force in the world for people and planet? And that's some of the work that Lift Economy does. So, some of you on this call might be having questions about how do I start that business? How do I grow my enterprise? What are the choices I need? What, what's even possible? So the, those four roles um, are kind of the, some of the that are accessible in some ways. At least one of those roles is accessible to all of us. And, uh, and it also can be time staggered. We've found some people who just want to become literate about what's happening in the next economy. I want a vision for an economy that works without compromise for people and planet. I want to know how I can start supporting that as a consumer, as an investor. And hey, now I'm ready to change my job. And you know, it's not just changing my job. I, I'm going to start that, that thing that's missing in my community. And so it happens over time. That framework Done. is so wonderful, and we have some questions filtering in. Um, we had a question early on around strategic partnerships and how to support this next economy. Um, and those that framework, those four roles, really, I think, gave some context. Um, we also had this great question from Sarah Kaplan, um, your view on a holistic retirement strategy. Um, and needing income and what's a long-term solution in the next economy, um, which would be a great, another great question to answer. And I'll let you pick how you want to stack these questions. Someone else wanted to share that um, they are looking to start a um, next economy law firm, uh, socially aligned law firm. And I, I think another one of our strategic partners is obviously the Sustainable Economies Law Center. Um, and obviously Jenny Casson being a part of the Lyft team as well. We're, we're, we're deeply committed to, um, to next economy legal uh, structures. So, so that's just a sampling of some of the questions that are coming in and wanted to share that. Great. 
and, and maybe I'll summary answer some of them and see where we want to go deeper. Um, I love this question about the partnership. So if you're kind of already literate and you're already embedded in your values and seeing the next economy, you know, how can you connect with projects, enterprises, organizations to, you know, support them or look for mutual, mutual catalyzation, catal catalyzing, mutual catalyzing, I don't even know if that's a word, um, but the, this mutual benefit, how, where, where do we go? How do we do that? Well, in our experience, one of the dilemmas uh, that we see when we look at the next economy is it's <clears throat> emerging in a spatially uh, disintegrated way. Um, we see, you know, a, a, a organization or enterprise over in, say, uh, North Carolina, and we see a, a farm in Sherwood, Oregon, and we see in, you know, an ocean uh, products, uh, regenerative uh, processing facility um, in the Northeast. Um, and we see, you know, a uh, women's empowerment, girls empowerment summer camp in, in Oakland. And we see these organizations and enterprises that are all kind of working from the place of trying to bring in the next economy in different places and at different times. And it's kind of, it can be really difficult to kind of um, get your head around where they all are and how to build those partnerships. One thing that uh, we've noted is that kind of cooperators are standing by. So there's organizations like Lyft Economy and, you know, the next system and the working world and uh, a whole kind of syndicate of organizations that are sharing um, some of the same literacy, maybe not semantically identical, but there are you know, uh, first, first, the first steps kind of identifying what's out there and assessment. So actually anybody who has a particular interest in developing a particular type of partnership in a particular region, um, go ahead and send us uh, an email um, or, and, and say, Hey, who do you know? Who do I connect with in, you know, the American Southeast or who do I connect with in, um, in and around Albuquerque and, 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 uh, um, Santa Fe and the likelihood of us having an ally that we know of that we could point you to who has kind of the local regional knowledge is really really high at this point over the last well definitely for lift economy over the last seven years we've worked with over a hundred different organizations all over the country um, and of course we know some of these other syndicate bodies that have been doing the community wealth mapping and the uh, kind of the next economy mapping that's out there. So identifying is first and then finding the opportunities for intersection and mutual support. So there's a bigger, bigger topic to talk about there. So I'll pause for a moment on that and switch to a second one, which was this question of this uh, retirement, which is just a beautiful thing. You know, there's this common theme that we see all over with people saying, how can I orient and design my life to support those good outcomes for people and planet, yet reclaim some sense of personal security into the, into as, as we age and, and get older and want to move into a place where we're not as actively contributing in the economy as, as workers maybe, but something of like a retirement. And one of the things we're learning, and we're still learning about this as to there's, there's a gradient to uh, so many of the answers that I might answer to your questions. And I think that's a really important eco-literacy concept just to notice the pattern of the gradient, meaning there's maybe a perfect vision for a retirement that we could all dream up as to what would be the perfect next economy aligned retirement strategy. And then there's steps that are decidedly less bad than the business usual tactics and norms, um, but they're accessible today and then maybe in 10 years more things will be more culturally visible and accessible. And then maybe in 10 years from now, more opportunities will be culturally visible and accessible. And so in the spirit of just naming some things along that gradient, um, the pattern is the first thing I'd name is that the norm in the business as usual economy is to accumulate wealth and assets so that as you move into retirement, your security is based in your assets being generating passive income, um, fixed income in the uh, in the markets, um, different types, of, whether it's in the banking or whether it's in the stock market, um, those are, uh, or in real estate, there's acquire assets and generate income, passive income in that way. 
uh, we would say that the, the framing probably for the next economy is to look and ask the question a little bit differently. How can I reduce my costs for living and my needs for any income into retirement as close to zero as possible? It doesn't mean you have to get to zero. It's, it's just the idea of reducing costs rather than, you know, enhancing your asset base. Um, again, that might be more in the perfect end of the gradient. But if you live in a community of dozens of people who care for you and will take care of you no matter what, if you have a house that has food security in terms of kitchen gardening and proximity to farmers that you've invested in over the last couple decades, nearby you, if you have the rain that falls onto your roof actually harvested into storage cisterns so it's clean to be potable and you have food security, housing security, water security, um, and loving relationships with people who will take care of you, um, it's probably priceless in terms of what, you know, compare that to having a million dollars in the stock market in an indexed portfolio that's doing a little bit less bad. Now, some of the pathways to get to that, I'll name one other thing that was something we're really excited about. And, and just to piggyback off Aaron's sharing of one of our core allies, the Sustainable Economies Law Center has been looking very closely at um, these ideas of, of doing self-directed IRAs. Right now, it is possible to do that. And with a self-directed IRA, um, you could move your money into more local um, or a portion of your money into more uh, local direct investments into enterprises that you know their practices, you can build trust and relationship, and those investments can provide a return. Um, you know, the, where that return could be even multiple, have multiple stacks to it, where maybe it's not just financial return, it could also be money or health security that comes from those investments local to the place that you live. And that, that type of retirement uh, strategy is partially accessible, I'd say. Some of the fees charged in setting up self-directed IRAs are currently not in alignment with the practices we'd like to see. And there are some emerging opportunities there that the Sustainable Economies Law Center is working on. And so again, there's a gradient, but uh, if we reorient our thinking about retirement and security and look at our money today, there's already right now hundreds or thousands of investment opportunities that are supportive of a less bad economy and some of them getting towards the place of actually supporting an economy that's totally in alignment with your values. And over time, over the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, we'll see more and more opportunities emerge as some of the people on this call start their companies and enterprises that are truly in alignment with values for the next economy and there'll be more opportunities to invest and support that. Kevin, um, Greta is writing in from a social enterprise she's starting in Chile, and she asks, I would love to hear about great ways to link up with other folks already working in the context of the next economy and explore more ways of collaborating by sharing resources, networks, skills, technical expertise, etc. And I know we're not quite there yet to, to talking about our cohort, but maybe we could share a little bit of, um, apart from emailing Lyft Economy, how, what is that that larger vision that we have of actually helping tie in these collaborations a little bit more? Sure. I mean, part of it is visionary. I think, Aaron, towards your question, which I like, is that uh, some of the vision of the future is is this idea of the take our table. I mentioned the, the example of that farm earlier. One hour table as an island, it doesn't have the power to shape the economy. And 10,000 hour tables or 100,000 hour tables in that model of a partially vertically integrated multi-stakeholder cooperative farming enterprise um, in communities all over the world, e even that doesn't necessarily move or reshape the economy. But a federated network of 100,000 or hundreds of thousands of multi-stakeholder cooperative vertically integrated farm operations actually does have the ability to shape the economy for its extended purchasing capacity and its ability to be a force for changing upstream impacts and then downstream impacts. And some of our future work at Lyft Economy is to do some of this federating, federating and connection um, so that in, in first maybe domestically or regionally near where some of the Lyft partners are and then ultimately globally. Uh, the, 
the what I would say right now is there are proxies for next economy literacy that do exist in other communities around around the world. Um, and so you'll find semantically people are calling things a little bit different. So you might look at people who are using terms like the solidarity economy um, and or in Chile, you might look towards people who are using jargon that's, you know, comes from the permaculture community um, and find allies there. I, emailing Lyft is still the most self-evident strategy that occurs to me as to how to because then I could put you in touch with the people that we know that uh, live in Chile or are from Chile who would know other people. And so it's a series of kind of, and that's just as one pattern of building rapport and network is to find allies who you can trust, who have a, a values alignment, a vision alignment with you, and then um, leverage your relational surface area to actually get closer and closer to those allies that can provide mutual support. And so anybody who is in Chile, we can, we can do our best to make connections and relationships there. Do you want to build on that, Aaron? Was there something I missed? No. One thing Kevin is like, sorry, this is Ryan. Um, I'm interested in, in that idea and like, what are the top two or three challenges we actually face at Lyft? Because I think it's helpful to see like, what is keeping us up at night with, um, what's keeping you up at night, Kevin, and actually being able to grow the next con? Like, what's the major blocks? And to add to that, I think people would also really enjoy hearing about how the Force for Good Fund is one step towards helping to replicate those model businesses. Great. Yeah, maybe I'll try and dovetail Yeah, um, that. Uh, um, it's not keeping me up at night, it's, but it's keeping me up at night because I'm excited is uh, the, the Force for Good Fund. Uh, there's a co-creation of Lyft Economy and Community Ventures in our, in our quest to kind of reinvent the nature of capital. And I guess that's one of the things that keeps me up at night, Ryan, is looking at the prodigious flows of capital around the world and the norms and heuristics around that. And by, why I say norms is that there's, there's cultural predispositions around how capital moves in, in terms of the agreements that limited partners make with general partners, especially in the world of private equity. And then there's norms and the structural constraints of the public equities marketplaces that uh, really distort um, the economy tor from its ability to achieve outcomes that are of benefit to people and planet. And so I see it as imperative actually for humanity to you know, reshape the economy. One of the things that breaks our heart the most or saddens us, but it does bring us alive too to respond is when we hear an entrepreneur who wants to start their next economy enterprise and they, they ask Lyft Economy, they call us and say, you know, I'm looking to raise venture capital. Um, as if like that's the knee jerk, like obviously that's the only way to do it, just to scale my impact as fast as possible. And usually with a couple of choice questions, we could determine if that person has really considered the constraints and the that the binding characteristic of taking an LP model uh, private equity investment and what that actually means. We find there's generally a lack of literacy and understanding of how the what what the agreements are that kind of set that money into motion. And so reinventing capital and how it flows is a big project, and we're chipping away at it. And what we did earlier. Uh, last year is we started something called the Force for Good Fund. We, we raised a million dollar fund or 1.1 million, we oversubscribed it, but it was still hard money to get. And it, the money was uh, on a particular thesis. The thesis was, how can we model a more diverse and inclusive economy uh, that also demonstrates outsized social and environmentally beneficial impacts, um, does return money to investors uh, but these are early stage companies that returns money to investors, but not necessarily beholden to outsized return expectations that are typically associated with such early stage investments. And so we want to demonstrate um, with this Force for Good Fund that we can provide returns to investors, create extraordinarily high and beneficial social and environmental impacts 
um, and create models that could be regionally replicated to have a more diverse and inclusive economy. So we're actively investing right now in women-owned, person-of-color-owned cooperatives, solving problems of social inequities and climate change and big problems at a regional scale. And they're going to grow, we hope, and their, our intention is to help them grow and support them to grow, but not grow such that they have to grow to meet the expectations of the norms of exploitation venture capital. So that's one thing that kind of keeps me up at night, both as excited and uh, I get nervous thinking about the, the enormity of the trillions of dollars flowing around that are continuing to do the destruction that we don't want to see happen. The other thing that keeps me up at night, Ryan, it's like a problem that Lyft Economy works with and, and struggles with is, and, and, we, and we have some answers, but we're learning as fast as we can, a lot of learning, and I'm, I'm always curious if anybody has additional insights, but it's something we call the PPP, or the price parity paradox. And the price parity paradox essentially suggests that when you as an enterprise um, actually invest in labor or people in ways that are both fair and generative, um, even transformational and growth and development oriented, and then you invest in your supply chain, optimizing you know, carbon capture, biodiversity, uh, clean water, clean air, um, net beneficial impacts within the environment for any materials in your supply chain. When you actually prioritize people and planet in your business, your cost of producing a good or service, but let's focus like on a good, the cost of producing that good generally is higher than when you exploit people and planet. And so when, when we have this grossly distorted economy with incredible uh, inequities in wealth from structural racism, structural sexism, and like the legacy of colonialism in general, and just the nature of the economy, we have this gross income inequity gross wealth inequity, how do we ask people who have very little to spend in terms of disposable dollars just to buy things that cost more from the emerging next economy than the exploitation economy because of this price parity paradox? How do we bring, how do we deliver goods at price parity with the exploitation or the business as usual economy um, from the next economy? Now, we do have some ideas, you know, micro vertical integration. There are major opportunities for innovation, community ownership, uh, worker ownership and distributing with surpluses. Um, there's ways to get efficiency within supply chain from regional sourcing. There's a, about eight ways that we've come up to address the price parity paradox. And you know what keeps me up at night, Ryan, is I know they're not enough. Like I, I, I know that those ways, maybe collectively when they're put together in the right mosaic and we get lucky, they're enough. But part of me worries that we actually need a transformation of human behavior where part of what actually needs to happen is people need to raise their eco literacy and change their consumption patterns to say, I'm going to divest from the business as usual economy, meet some of my needs myself, maybe purchase my goods from the reuse market. Um, uh, maybe try to share and access things instead of own them and then save up and then invest in the materials that are coming from the next economy. Every purchase, I'm okay paying a price premium because I know it's actually benefiting people and planet in extraordinary ways. And I get scared by the idea that we have to change human behavior because I know how hard it is to change my own behavior. Kevin, I want to tie in a question that's coming from Lonnie around partnerships with city governments. And I'm really excited that you mentioned that Lyft Economy is on a highway of learning right now. I love how you phrased it. We're, we are actively learning as we go and iterating. We, in terms of sort of the permaculture principle of uh, quick feedback loops to iterate on our vision of how this next economy transformation is taking place. And um, I'll answer just really quickly around our experience working with local cities to change their current role. And I want to tie in um, climate and, and our environmental context into this discussion. So I, I'm based in Sonoma County, and we just had one of the worst natural disasters in the history of California hit um, Sonoma County with fires. And so there's these outside catalysts that are happening in our communities. And for us, that catalyst 
has actually forced collaboration with city government in a really different way um, between the grassroots community that's responding to the disaster and the city that's now recognizing that certain aspects of the economy as they're built um, are not resilient. Um, aspects like um, the uh, power lines that, fall, that fell in these high winds and produced these um, horrible, tragic um, fires that, that, you know, just the disaster was hit, hit us really hard. And so how do we as a community, and I'm learning this as I go in the community that I grew up in and have lived in for um, you know, almost 30 years now, how, how do we um, organize with government, with, with cities and meet the needs that they're seeing of needing more nimble, more, um, more self-resilient community members, um, homes that are you know, uh, fire resistant, um, and so maybe Kevin, you could talk a little bit about how the next economy MBA, how we see that as being quite project based and quite responsive in that we actually, we want the cohort to be people that are learning these principles, becoming literate, and then trying small experiments in their community, implementation experiments to actually um, transfer that knowledge and that literacy around next economy principles out into the, the communities that they're working in. Yeah, great. I'll, I'll try and build on both the comment about the MBA and our intentions with uh, providing that, um, as well as just dovetail one um, reference point. Uh, one of Lyft Economy's current clients is an organization called Civic Makers who is working with uh, municipalities and state governments um, to kind of bring human-centered design literacy. So government as public servant, government as facilitator of authentic outcomes of benefit to people and planet. What does that look like? How do we make those transformations? And they're actually being very successful right now and providing some trainings and I'm excited to see as their outcomes are rolling in. Um, so if it, I think it was Lonnie, if you don't know of Civic Makers, definitely check them out and connect and we'd be happy to connect you. Uh, the Next Economy MBA. So it's it's kind of, we, we Lyft Economy experimented with a, this year, this calendar year, a online kind of training cohort of uh, enterprises that were um, in kind of early stages and moving into initial growth. Um, and prior to that, almost all of our work had either been on life, one-on-one -on -one with clients, or one-on-one -on -one using video conference tools and so forth. And so what we're, what we're hearing from that group um, and from others is that, is there a way where we could provide some type of facilitated learning experience where we could raise our collective eco-literacy or literacy about what the next economy is and then actually put it into action, but not just if we have an enterprise. Um, maybe we're just curious and want to be an actor in our community and do community organizing and, and resilience, or maybe just want to personally change, incrementally change your career. Like how do I get a job that isn't soul crushing and actually is contributing to you know, a larger community of businesses that are trying to be a force for good? Or you know, how do I, you know, uh, you know I'm, I want to start something, but I want to have it be flexible enough to be a stay-at-home mom and take care of my kids and homeschool a group of kids and find out how to design an enterprise. And it's something I want to do over the next five years, not right now. Um, that kind of question, we receive these very specific questions. And so we, we, we said for this next year, this next calendar year, let's try and create a training that's a little bit more general, a learning experience that... Um, enables people to plug in where we can meet you where you're at and we're not going to leave you where you're at um, but meet you where you're at and collectively move towards this next economy exploring a diversity of strategies that you can use but giving you a full kind of literacy of what it means it to you know play one of those four roles in um, the emerging next economy so literacy about what's possible and then some competencies about 
How would it be to work within my community, my neighborhood, my city, my bioregion? How can I do some of this community organizing so that there's it's more self-evident, the federated connection between enterprises? How would I start an enterprise? Even if it's not something I'm doing today, what are the best practices or good practices for accessing capital from a community of investors that I really can trust where the constraints on the capital actually enable me to emphasize the impacts, the beneficial impacts that I want to create? Um, how do I get an aligned vision so that I can actually bring in a team? How could I get a team of people together where we actually create a crucible of personal growth and development as a company itself? So sometimes we say next economy companies are, you know, basically like friend networks where we get to be mutually supporting each other to be our best selves. What does that look like in the context of an enterprise? How do we communicate in a way that actually creates generative outcomes? So many people are scared of meetings and organizing and facilitation and so forth. How can we make it so that our communication experiences are actually transformative, wonderful, and efficient so we get things done? Um, and then what about the nuts and bolts of just actually running an enterprise so that you're prepared for a job or a vocation or a calling, no matter where you are on that scale right now, maybe you know exactly that you want to be doing something in, you know, the world of renewable energy and project management, or maybe you know you want to, uh, you know, start uh, a very particular enterprise in, um, in an area around recycling and waste management. Great, um, we can meet you there and show kind of the patterns of any enterprise in any industry, what needs to be there. And that's the intent of the MBA, what we're calling the, we're calling it the next economy MBA. Um, maybe that's culturally familiar with people as a term. I don't know, Aaron or Ryan or Sean, if you wanna build on that in any way as to how that kind of, some of the things we're thinking about creating for this learning experience next year. I think you got most of it, Kevin. Um, I mean, I think it's, you know, if you typically the only uh, option for folks who want to learn business skills is there's a lot of stuff out there in this sort of older, uh, what we would call extractive economy. So you can learn how to do leveraged buyouts um, and pay $150,000 to go to business school. But we felt that there was, um, there's got to be a better way. Uh, and so we've kind of strung together our own work with 100, uh, over 100 social enterprises over the last seven years and identified some patterns and then bringing in some thought leaders, um, some of the literature around you know, reinventing organizations, Frederick Lalu, uh, Charles Eisenstein, Sacred Commerce, there'll be some stuff on B corporations. Um, but the idea is to really have a, a business focused can do uh, approach, but also integrating these regenerative next economy principles. I have so much to say on this because I, I deeply considered going to business school and just my personal path. Um, I, I really have, have learned so much through my work with Lyft Economy and, and personally it didn't align with me to, with my personal path to go into debt. And so um, I've, I've uh, chosen uh, a, a different path um, to, to pursue my personal self-development and, and um, self-education. And um, that I think is really the spirit behind uh, our desire to make this opportunity more accessible to more people. Um, and, and I also took a permaculture design course in, in 2011 and that um, helped solidify a lot of my uh, thinking around an economy that works for the benefit of all life. So we kind of, we're, we're complementing um, ecological design and ecological knowledge into the curriculum around um, economic, which the, the core root of the word economy is really home care. Um, that's, that's the origin of that word. And so how do we take care of our home in a better way? Um, and so Ruth just asked a question. Um, I do want to go back to the supply chain question that Greta articulated so beautifully. Um, but I do want to start orienting our conversation to uh, what the specificity of the next economy MBA is. And Ruth just asked, how many places are left? Um, and will it be a first come, first served basis or selection? Um, there are so few seats. 
Um, and so maybe uh, Kevin or Ryan, could, could you address that and, and the actual en enrollment process? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. There's uh, links on uh, our website, um, lifteconomy.com, I think, slash MBA for registration. And I'll confess that I haven't been tracking the um, registration so far, so I don't know how many people have signed up. Um, and I, I let's see, what I could commit to is, uh, I guess, through our newsletter, which goes out once a month with resources, we could we can share, um, you know, how many spots are left. That would be one way we can communicate feedback. You could email us and, and ask us um, if you're, you know, if you want more information or you're in a decision-making mode um, and you're looking for um, knowing if there's a, a spots left and so forth. Um, but registration is fairly simple. Um, basically, um, you can uh, click on some of the links on the website and just, just reserve your spot to, to be a participant. Ryan, did I miss anything? Yeah, one other thing, I, I put in the, the link to the chat. Um, we're also offering a discount of 10% um, for folks who sign up in the next 48 hours. Um, so it's for, we have two payment options as well. One is like a prepay for the nine months, um, which is uh, $4,000. And then there's a full, or sort of a month to month payment of $500 a month for folks who wanna pay that way, but that would be a little more expensive. It's 4,500. Um, and uh, we do have a disc. Yeah, so there's the discount code and the links are in the side uh, on the chat as well. Okay. Sure. I want to interject around the, the language of accessibility too and just say that we do have some language on the lifteconomy.com MBA around reserving spots. We've reserved 13 of the spots in the course for uh, persons of color and that's self-defined. Um, so if you, if you self-identify as a person of color and want to take advantage of those spots, there are spots reserved specifically for that. Um, you know, we, we recognize that we cannot change the underpinning flaws of an economy without addressing equity um, and uh, and so that's one strategy where we're, we're trying to to make this course specifically um, more well represented of, of who actually is a player and, and maker and shifter in this economy um, and there is one question around uh, how this course is applicable on a global scale um, so uh, there's someone on the webinar from Spain and she's hearing that this is very logical and very US centered some of the principles we've shared um, so uh, Kevin could you speak to whether this MBA would be pertinent for those of us not living and working um, in the US I certainly imagine many parts of it would be in that uh, we, do, we do have some clients that have uh, their operations uh, outside over the last few years, we've had clients who you know operate in different countries, um, and we as individuals have experience working with enterprises in different places. And there are obviously place-based and cultural-based dynamics that might make some of the information that we would explore together less relevant. I think we're structuring the course mainly in the training and the learning experience mainly on principles and patterns. Um, and then enabling your questions and your project-based work to get the specifics um, where there might be you know, significant regional differences. In our experience, almost any human endeavor, enterprise or organization anywhere in the world has some very consistent repeating themes. We call these the patterns of enterprise in the next economy. And those repeating themes examples would be like, how do humans communicate when you get together to make a decision? Um, how do you set an aligned vision that's actually concrete enough to actually get feedback loops that enable you to be of benefit? What does of benefit mean? Not in terms of the specific practices of, say, agriculture or, you know, supply chain partnerships in a particular place, but how do you go about prioritizing what does benefit for people and planet actually mean? What's feasible? Uh, how do you do operational forecasting with uh, your kind of financial projections and being you know transparent about your um, and understanding how to start that process of identifying the costs and potential forecasts of of revenues? Um, how do you set up operational systems 
for uh, personal growth and development and recruiting new people to teams and um, onboarding and supporting team members, no matter what type of organization it is? How do you manage the whole administrative layer of running a business or enterprise? Many of those things with obviously like in the legal area of administration, there's going to be very regional, um, there's going to be regional differences and considerations, but the broad strokes themes will be, I believe, universal to any human um, endeavor. Uh, so I would, I would say some of, some of the content would probably be very US centric and some of most of it would be broadly applicable. I want to speak, um, if I could interject, I want to speak to this uh, question of credit certification, um, accreditation. Um, and the certificate that you would receive is uh, uh, being a part of the inaugural cohort of the Lyft Economy MBA. So it, it, is, it is not accredited nor certified. Um, and one thing I will say is we did just recently uh, complete one cohort of about 15 students in, um, in a course we called How to Prepare Your Enterprise for Growth. And some of the value that folks have been receiving ongoing, even though that course is completed, um, the relationships from that have, have stayed consistent. And, and a lot of people mention partnerships and collaborations as being one of the core obstacles or barriers to engaging in this next economy. I just want to give one example of one member that was in our cohort, um, a, a a couple that's starting a restorative ocean farm off the coast of California in, in San Diego. Um, and through the course that they took and their relationship with Lift Economy, we've actually introduced them to the head of California Fish and Wildlife, who then recently, I just heard a couple of weeks ago, spent about a day and a half visiting their farm, learning about their farm, and is now ready and willing and a direct result of the partnership with Lyft Economy um, to be able to support them at the, he at the, the fish and wildlife um, agency realm and um, provide uh, just support in permitting and leasing and, and all of these sorts of relationship-based, critical relationships that are critical to the, their success of their enterprise. So that's just one example. We have a couple other examples from our recent cohort um, but yeah, certification is probably not the reason you would <laughs> take this course. Um, so, and Re Revi, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but this is a great idea.